you so much for your patience. Are we live? We are live. Okay. Everybody, thank you so much for your patience, and welcome to this 10th episode of 20-something live. We are live here in Las Vegas. We had our 20-something panel earlier at EDM Biz, so be sure to tune in for that. Some of the past participants from our show, as well as some newcomers as well. And obviously, we didn't want to miss a week of bringing you knowledge from industry professionals. So today on the show, we are going to have Aubrey, who is the CEO, or I guess a founder at Nocturnal Touring. He does tour management for the likes of Dirty South, also handles advancing for rehab and Nervo and a whole bunch of others, formerly the tour manager for Sebastian and Grosso and also considers himself a life coach in his spare time. We have my good friend Ben Baruch, who is the manager for Big Gigantic. He also is a founder and partner at This Song is Sick, the blog that I'm sure many of you know. And he also is a talent buyer for the Brooklyn Bowl in Las Vegas. And lastly, we have my friend Clayton Warwick, who is a founder at a blog by the name of The Music Ninja on Hype Machine and breaking tons of today's best tunes. So first and foremost, I'm going to bring in my good friend, Aubrey Wright. And there we go. Sorry, we're doing this off one computer day. Aubrey, what's up, buddy? Well, that's good, man. How are you? How are you? You're in Vegas, too. We're on the same flight. How are you doing? Uh, I'm good, actually. I'm. It's like the calm before the storm. we got to go out to site tonight. So uh, I got all the crew coming in tonight, and I'm just waiting for their uh, confirmation that they made it here safely. What are you going so, out to site? We talk about site. Uh, you talk about Las Vegas, obviously. EDC you. Vegas. But they, uh, a couple of the guys wanted to go out there tonight, um, and I don't think that they're going to, just based upon I don't think the structures are built yet. But it's just everyone <laughs> everyone coming into town today. It's good. A lot of people were on that flight, and I think everyone's in good spirits. It's uh, it's a very massive stage this year for main stage, so it's really cool. Is it bigger than last year? Um, I think it actually is bigger. It's four hundred. I think it's four hundred and fifty feet wide, and I want to say a hundred feet tall. That might be too big. I gotta look at the plans, but regardless, I mean it's it's massive. It's a huge structure and you know if you ever look at pictures of it on how they construct it with all the scaffolding, it's it's amazing to look at. Absolutely massive. Well Aubrey, it was important for me to have you on the show because I think there's not enough credit given to tour managers. But it was also important for me to have you on the show because I feel like finding the right tour manager to bring on the show First has been a little bit difficult, and you and I got a chance to hang out a few weeks ago, and I really felt like the level of dedication that you put forth to your clients in the Department of Tour Management, where you could probably do a lot more clients than I can do as a manager, but I felt like that dedication was really mirrored, and I've yet to meet many tour managers um, that operate at that level of professionalism and actually have built companies based off of it. So you were in the process of doing that. Obviously, you partnered with Maddie. I know that, yeah. who Knife Party's tour manager and also does advancing for my client, Pegboard Nerds. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the formation of your guys' company, what the plans <laughs> are, and how you guys do things a bit differently than other tour managers. And how we met. Yeah, um, of course. How you met is actually a great story. I'd love for you to start there. Um, well, me and Maddie are partners in it, and the way that we like to do it is we like to put out tour managers who have a background in touring because there's a lot of, um, you know, especially in the dance scene, there's a lot of friends out there that go out and uh, they're not actual tour managers. And there's a lot of really good tour managers out there in the scene. Um, you know, like Avicii's tour manager, Kira, she's amazing. Uh, we have Matt Flyzik out with Showtech right now. You know, Matty's great. Uh, Manny himself is out there and he has a touring company as well. Uh, on tour management, and there's a lot of good uh, production teams out there, and it's starting to just become an industry where it's very important to have a proper team. And like you guys out with Corella, you guys have Chris V out there with you, and Chris V has been touring game for a long time too. And it's uh, it's pretty cool to see how everyone, basically from the rock scene, is now coming into the dance scene because it's becoming such a massive touring industry that you need the proper you know, personnel to do it. Um, but yeah, me and Maddie are partners in it. Maddie's still running out with Knife Party, and 
you know, we oversee every email that comes in on all the advances, which is, it can be overwhelming, but, you know, our guys are good, and, you know, they reach out if they need help, and, um, you know, one day him and I were just talking, and we just thought that we would join forces. Uh, I was handling, I think, four artists at once, and I think he has three or four, and we're like, why don't we, you know, we're really good friends, so we, we put it together, and um, it's just it's just been great. I mean, the first time we met, uh, you know, we both wanted to fight each other, which was actually, it was out at, it was out at EDC, so. Why don't you tell everybody a little bit about it? I think it's a great story. So, um, it is a problem with DJs. It is everyone prepares their sets before the shows, and uh, it's kind of funny how, you know, you get protective of it. It would be like, you know, if, if someone's playing your song before you go on, you know, you're going to tell them to stop playing your song, and uh, Knife Party was going on right before Sebastian during EDC a couple years ago, and I heard uh, Save the World coming on, and I looked at Seb, and he looked at me, and it was a remix, and it was their remix that they did with Knife Party, that Swedish house had done, and it was hilarious because Seb was like, it's cool, it's their remix, don't worry about it. Um, or no, that was Antidote. And so that song went away, and then they were like, this is our last song, and then I hear Save the World come on. And he got upset with it and you know, kind of gave me an eye, and I just ran on stage, and I started, you know, went right past you know, Maddie to the manager and started screaming at the manager to pull the thumb drives out and to turn it down and change it in the next song. And then here comes this guy, Matty. I had no idea who he was, and he was like, you know, who the F are you, mate? Get out of my face. And it took uh, Harry, the stage manager, to come between us and say, like, you know, look, guys, we're not fighting today. We're all friends here. And here goes Seb running right past us and jumps up in the booth with Knife Party and, you know, has a good time. And so me and Matty then found out who you know, our backgrounds were, and it was pretty funny, and uh, later on that night at Excess, we hung out, and then we've just been best friends since, so it's um, it's funny, often, a lot of my relationships started with a lot of, um, you know, bad advances, or, it's pretty funny how that works out, a lot of anger turns into really good uh, friendships, so. Yeah, if you handle it the right way, and are open to that person, I, I, yeah. I felt like who I thought was an enemy instantly becomes one of my best friends and yeah. it kind of shows you you never judge somebody. Yeah, so, yeah, we're, we're busy touring right now and, you know, we're out here at EDC. He actually gets in, I think, tonight. Um, and, you know, we'll meet up and go over things. And, yeah, it's a busy, it's busy this year. I have Martin Garrix, who's, you know, really excited to come out here and rehab and, I think we also have Jamie Jones, and obviously Knife Party is doing their thing, and we're gonna be busy. But it's it's fun. There's a lot of really good people out here, and um, you know the industry is definitely platformed as far as uh, touring goes and production. It's it's pretty eye opening when you go to a dance show and look at the production compared to the rock shows nowadays. The production is just so massive, and it's it's really cool. Like it's it's awesome. Definitely. So, what do you? Why do you think there hasn't been, or do you feel like there has been, a tour management company is doing what you're doing, and how are you guys going to do it differently? There's actually a lot. Um, I think that it's, it's like the, there was tour support for a while out of the UK, um, and I think that tour managers tend to have their own companies in general. Um, you know, one of my friends has, uh, you know. Uh, he has one where it's just him and a partner, and they just one one side of the company does production, the other side does the tour management, and then Curly, who was our tour director on Swedish House Mafia, he um, he used to work with Amy Winehouse and Slayer, and he's been doing it for years, and he has a company, the same thing, and uh, he has two two tour managers out or three. He he own, he owns and operates MJM. And he oversees Avicii, he oversees Axwell and Grosso, Alesso. And so, I mean, there's companies out there doing it. Um, I just think that, you know, it depends on how much you know about them. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a private industry, I think, is what it is. You know, a lot of 
I don't think anyone really reaches out. I think um, you know from the companies. So it's it's really word of mouth, you know. And I don't know Manny. Manny, I know his company is out there. He pushes it a lot. He has merch and all that stuff. And I don't know. I th I think everyone's company is built differently, and based upon clientele and you know who's out on their staff and it's it's great I I really can't say there's you know every company is different that's doing it and I can't say ours is better than anyone and I wouldn't because I respect everyone in their industry and you know there's much better tour managers than there you know than I am uh, at certain things and I respect everyone that's trying to do what they want to do and it's it's really cool so what was it like being on tour with Sebastian and Grosso, you know, during one last tour, and obviously sort of the most iconic tour that's really happened in dance music maybe ever? Uh, what was it like to be a part of that, and I don't know any stories that you have for us? Yeah, you know, honestly, it was one of the most emotional tours I've ever been on, and I think that it, at first it was a lot of like, you know, it was just insane had the magnitude of it, but just seeing a production that big being put together because it was built off Kinesis uh, video walls and all their video walls were moving and it just kept getting better and better of a show. They wanted more pyro and they were so creative with it and those guys were just so cool. I mean, it was a big family. Um, Amy Thompson was out with us for uh, most of the world part of the tour and you know, I really look up to her for all she does. And it's it was an experience. You know, I think everyone got tired at one point and you know, the guys all have families and they all want to go home to their families and you know, the it was some of the longest hours on tour and you know, there was always, you know, good times, there was always bad times, but for the most part I think what really kept everyone together on it was the crew. And Curly was the tour director on that, and you know he kept everyone very tight, and uh, it, it was fun. It was an experience. Seb is, you know, I'll always love him as a boss, and you know he's now doing the Axwell and Grosso partnership, and you know I wish him the best. We still keep in touch, and there's, uh, you know, it, it's cool working with someone who is very intelligent but also has a heart for family, and that's how all those guys were. And, you know, it, it, was, it was fun. Most, more importantly, I think it was a very fun tour um, because in the beginning it was, it was a lot of excitement. Then throughout the middle of it, you know, you start getting tired, but towards the end it was excitement and emotion because it was something so big coming to an end. And everyone felt it, so that last show in Miami... You know, was, no one wanted it to stop. So it, it was emotional. It was fun. But, I, you know, if you've seen the movie, you know, it's that it wasn't all captured in that movie. You know, there was a lot of really fun times that we had, like in India. And it was cool. It was... I'll never forget it. How about that? Yeah, I love it, Aubrey. One last question for you. What's this yeah, I hear man. about you being a life coach? So... Um, a lot of people hit me up for it, and right now I'm taking on clients when I'm home and doing like you know different projects and keeping people in line with uh, their goals. Something that I really love to do is obviously on my Instagram, you know, I'll post a picture, but you know, every day is you know positive words to help people get through their day, and I know that a big part of uh, getting through any day is just you know, having a very positive mind, and sometimes it's the reality that, you know, it's life, but I like to help people succeed, and that's something that, you know, I always try and get back to people, and so any way I can do that, I do it, and if it's sitting down, you know, having a cup of coffee with someone, or it's like, you know, I'm working with someone right now on a three-week project to get them to where they want to go, then I'll do that too, but everything is because I just love to see people succeed, and, uh, you know, I'm always here for people. I've just always been one of those guys. So, as busy as I am, I always take time out to help people do what they want to do. So, that's powerful. Thank you, take for taking time out of your busy yeah, day. Yeah, man.
Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Cool, brother. All right. I will see you on site. All right. Thanks, Albert. See you, bud. All right, guys. And as I bring him in right now, we have Ben Baruch, who is a talent buyer in Las Vegas here at one of the most profound venues in America, Brooklyn Bowl. He's going to tell us a little bit about that. He's also the manager of Big Gigantic and a partner at This Song is Sick. Um, to my knowledge, the largest music discovery blog on the internet. Ben, what's up, buddy? How you doing, buddy? How are you? I'm great. I'm great. It's uh, raining in Colorado uh, before I head out to Vegas tomorrow. But uh, I'm sure it'll clear up in five minutes like it always does. And you're going to avoid the mad day, huh? I am, man. I'm coming in and out, you know, uh, getting some stuff done, coming to our show tomorrow at uh, Brooklyn Bowl Vegas with uh, Big Gigantic and Bro Safari and Flash Adamas. Uh, they're putting on with Insomniac, uh, do a few meetings, and then uh, get right out of there after the show. Your passion's crazy. We always talk about how you do all these different things. Not only make it all work, but you have every morning at 6 in the morning, you know, getting it done. What, what, where does that feel come from? I don't know, man. It's just always kind of just been in my blood. You know, I uh, if I'm not sleeping, my head's racing. So, uh, you know, as soon as I get up, I want to get right in front of the computer and start working. I don't know where it comes from. I mean, you know, I was always kind of instilled that from my parents, but it didn't really start kicking in until uh, after college when I can do things I really wanted to do. What was that first thing that you did after college to get you to this point? I mean, I moved right to L.A. I was a theater and film major, and my passion was always music, so I was playing music with bands, but I felt uh, that if I worked in music, I would lose that passion. So I, I moved to L.A., Worked in film, worked every Craigslist job I could find of production assistant and working on sets and working in management companies for film and then finally went into the agent world um, and still played music out there. I formed a band in L.A. and was playing music, but just, again, kind of as a hobby and just keeping that going. And then once I started working in film, the more I got into it, it was like, man, this isn't for me, so I started a production company and music, you know, promotion company, really, and production out in, uh, in L.A., and uh, and was promoting shows out there. Just found a room in the middle of nowhere and in kind of uh, down Pico. It's called Fado Doe, and no one really used it, but it felt like a New Orleans venue that you can kind of, you know, didn't have the rules and the, the five, ten-minute little slots that they gave bands out in L.A. on the Strip and wanted to create a vibe uh, for, for bands to actually be able to play shows. And... Uh, Promoted, you know, it started with two shows. They both sold out. Uh, noticed there wasn't like really a jam scene out in LA, which is kind of where I, my head was and came from in college in Vermont, and uh, formed that scene in LA. And literally, like, it would just kind of became, and still now, even when Golden Voice puts on shows with jam bands and bands that are now crossing over in the, you know, the disco biscuits of the world, the sound show sector nines, you know we're still on it because, you know, we, we literally just had a guy with a clipboard, you know, getting email addresses at every show and built like a 30,000-person email list for those for those diehard fans. Um, so that's kind of where it started. So how did the partnership, were you always through Golden Voice or how did the partnership with Golden Voice start? Sorry, you broke up. Say that again? I said, were you, was it always a part of Golden Voice or how did that start? No, not at all. I mean, it was my own company. So I started my promotion company, which still exists, is called Wagatail Productions. Um, I started with a venue, just kind of doing it, and uh, that one venue turned the club asking me to do shows, and the Roxy did was there, and then um, I got bigger, and you know, and then Golden Voice kind of would bring me on for shows that were, you know, jam, ex you know, jam bands or you know, in that world, experimental. And then I had like, you know, 10 venues around L.A. where I was doing shows, um, which I, you know, now w once I left L.A., I, you know, I got brought on to come to Colorado to book the, to book the Fox Theater and Boulder Theater, um, but still kept, uh, you know, the name and the brand in L.A. So now, you know, we get brought on, you know, from different, from Golden Voice and other promoters that, you know, because we built that scene. Definitely. It's still and then an you? Ind you know, independent company, so you'll see a lot of these, you know, yeah. When did you make your transition into becoming a manager and also a partner at This Song is Sick? Um, so when I left, you know, I was always, 
you know, my head always kind of worked like a manager, even though when I was, you know, when I was playing in my band in L.A., I ran everything. I got us our agent. I kind of booked a lot of shows. So my head was always in that space. But when I moved to Colorado um, to book the Fox Theater and the Boulder Theater, I met Dominic and Jeremy, who are in Big Gigantic, and we just started hanging. And they were just starting to form Big Gigantic, and this was in 2008. And... You know, they'd be around the venues. You know, I had connections with different promoters and different bands because I was booking venues, and they were just starting out. And I saw something there, and they asked for some help. And I was like, you know, I definitely I wasn't a manager at that point, but I definitely my head always worked like a manager did. And so I said, you know, definitely down to help, and let's see where this goes. And kind of the rest really is history. But that's how that's how the band thing and the management thing got started. What was their first big break? I mean, their first big break was when, you know, Sound Tribe Sector 9 brought us on tour, on a national tour. And, you know, we saw immediate, I mean, it grew from, our numbers grew so rapidly. We were playing, you know, 200, we played 200 cap room, and then we went on that tour, and then 400, and then 700, and 1,000, 2,000, and every, you know, every market, every tour. You know, we didn't tour, you know, I know, Big Gigantic is definitely in the EDM space, but you know we toured like a band. You know a lot of the, a lot of DJs tour like DJs. You know and they play like venues with you know like just DJ rooms. You know and we didn't do that. We toured like a lot of band would tour and really built markets and paid attention to every single market um, and every coast that you can think of. So you know our big break, you know our first big break was being asked to go on a national tour by them, but by Sound Tribe, but um. Our first two tours, you know, I booked. I booked it for them, you know. And, uh, you know, we booked it kind of to, really together, though, you know, as, uh, as the three of us. I love the DIY mentality, and I also think that it's really interesting because Big Gigantic, you know, you talk about being in live rooms, and I think the dance music is going to start going way more live over the next couple years. I think people are, I don't want to say they're sick of it, but... Um, I think that there's a lack of innovation going on with the artists. I think the festivals and the business are innovating faster than the artists are. And Big Gigantic is a prime example of somebody that's created their own completely unique lane for themselves, which is really interesting because I don't feel like you're competing against anybody in dance music or any band on the planet for that matter. Yeah, it's really cool to see. You know, it's, it's you know, kind of break into the This Song is Sick world a little bit, which I'm a partner with with Nick, but you know, we're starting to hear a lot of music come out overseas with, with saxophone. And, you know, to, to us, you know, we've been doing this. That was, like, what separated us. You know, we were an electronic act that had live instruments with drums, saxophone, um, and Dominic being, you know, a producer. But there, the saxophone is, like, the new guitar, with a lot, you know, that we're seeing in the, a, lot of, a lot of electronic acts. You know, we've been doing it for so long. It's cool to see. And, it, you know, we always heard early on when we were touring, you know, if it wasn't for you guys, we would never have seen a saxophone from these young fans. We would never have seen, you know, a drum set, you know, because a lot of these kids, all they saw were, were you know, DJs. And it was a hybrid, and it still is, but it, it's definitely becoming more and more, obviously, you know, Pretty Lights with the live brand and, you know, Chromatic, you know, live band and, um, a lot, you know, a lot of people. And it's just, it's something that we've been doing for so long, and it's very cool for us to, to see... You know, to see it, to see how it's you know evolving in the, in the dance space. You guys always raise the bar. I remember watching at Coachella with Wade and seeing the whole marching band come out and join you guys on stage. How much more difficult is it? Um, I obviously know the answers, but I'm not sure that our audience is to tour live than it is to just tour a DJ. I mean, from, from a production standpoint specifically. I mean, for a pretty you know, our our you know, I always had the vision with the band. You know that we, you know, how are we going to separate ourselves? And you know, we obviously did that with our music, but coming from a theater background and film, um, and I know you think this way as well. It's you know, how do you separate yourself visually as well? And it was always, you know, I I did drawings with the guys, and we would draw napkins and production, and you know, and then give it to our LD to turn into real life. But you know, we always had a set and a concept, you know, and. We, we tour like with a semi, you know, we, we, we tour with massive production and we always have and that's definitely been something that separated us, you know, early on to always help us get to that next level is, you know, when we were playing 200 cap rooms or playing 200, 500 cap rooms, 
we were touring as if we were playing 2,000 cap rooms. You know, we took that risk early on in that investment to really bring out extra production to make it that much more skeptical, you know, to like really, really bring the music and the visual to, to, to something that, you know, made an experience for every show. But as far as like, you know, touring as a live band, you know, because it's only two guys, it's not that much different. Um, you know, it's not that much baggage minus just the, the the drum set, you know, and the saxophone, and obviously, you know, Dom uses keyboards and, and triggers and that type of thing. But the main thing is just always, you know, raising the bar and setting us apart, you know, early on with, with a set, a new set every year for for kids to look, look forward to. You talk about saxophone being present in a lot of good dance music tunes right now. Sax is obviously the instrument of the summer. Um, you know, I assume when I go to Ibiza, I'm going to be hearing a lot of sax. So do you guys have a record um, that's going to be coming out in the next few months that people can look forward to? Do you think you can really take this craze by storm? Obviously, you guys are one of the ones that founded the sound. We are. And now we are. I mean, you know, Dom's definitely working on a lot of stuff right now, and we're working with different producers on collaborations. It's, you know, it's interesting that we're getting a lot of calls right now, you know, from people that want Dominic to be on the tracks because it's kind of, you know, the hot thing. Uh, it's inter It's fun, yes, and there's definitely going to be something that, that we come out with, and Dom's working with some people right now to, you know, that'll definitely, and it'll be different because a lot of these people have this sax riff, and, you know, Dominic definitely stands out, you know, he, he has a master's in music, you know, and it, it's not just your, a riff here and there. I mean, for anyone that's seen him, they, they can definitely tell the difference between Dominic playing the sax and, and some other people, but... Um, it's awesome for, for, for a lot of these people to kind of see and have him help them and, and that whole thing. Um, you're incredibly humble. I know how exciting it must be with all those people reaching out. Um, and I assume that it's not just from the saxophone freight craze that's going on right now. I'm sure there's even more people reaching out this week because you guys had an incredible Bonnaroo experience. I've only been able to live vicariously through your Facebook statuses. Talk to us a little bit about the jam session with Skrillex, how it came together, um, and yeah, what it was, it was like. It was a very proud moment for you. It's incredible. Yeah, it was something, you know, for me beyond just being a part of it. You know, I, I've never missed a Bonnaroo. I've been to every, I've been 13 years to every Bonnaroo, and uh, ah. and uh, I've been friends with the guys that have put it on from year one. And I started three years as a camper, and then moved into an RV, and then. Finally, you know, was in the industry and had a tour bus, and now I have a tour bus every year that's friends of mine. So beyond just Big Gigantic, you know, Bonnaroo over other festivals mean a lot to me and kind of where, you know, I'm where I'm at today a lot of because I'm seeing these super jams, which is to me one of the most, you know, the most important things for kids to see. It's a once-in-a-lifetime jam that will happen once and will never happen again. And, uh... And so I've always obviously wanted to be a part of it. And, you know, Paul Peck, who's the producer of the Super Jam, every year, for the past two years, we've talked about involving Big Gigantic. But last year, it didn't make sense. Um, we were in the middle of, re of recording an album and writing an album. And it, it's a lot of time because you're literally putting together a, a band uh, that's never played together that needs to write and get together and rehearse. And it's a lot of time. So last year we just weren't able to do it, and uh, this year, as soon as I saw the lineup come out, um, I called Paul and I said, you know, the Skrillex one would be perfect for us. You know, make something kind of special and do a live band around Sonny um, if this is something he's into. And Sonny's agent Lee and I go way back. We went to college together, so we're cl super close. And uh, so our teams have been friends for a while, but we thought this would be something really cool to put together. Lee immediately called Paul as well with the idea and getting a live band together. And next thing you know, like Sonny's team were, were super into it, and we were into it. And we got asked to, you know, for Dom to be the musical director. So basically, you know, work with all, take Sonny's ideas and vision, and then for Dom to help with that, and then bring that to all the musicians that we were going to add to it. Um, so he could, you know, basically just come to rehearsal and talk to Lauren Hill, and this is what it's going to do, and talk to Mystical, and you know, and literally like write this thing out. So Dom got on the, you know, got on the bus with Sonny, and they kind of spent a week and a half together. You know, phone calls prior to that, but just got on the bus and uh, started just writing out like who should come out when and how should we rephrase these and taking like 
a song like Fire in the Mountain by Grateful Dead where we had Mickey Hart on drums and turn into an electronic song and taking a Fuji's track and mixing it up and um, it was amazing like it, you know it's something like I said beyond just having my band involved it was you know Super Jams and Bonnaroo meant a lot to me and being in these rehearsals and seeing these music musicians like who've never got together and it's the first time that you know they took different genres to make it into a super jam. I mean, it's one thing to get a lot of mixture of rock musicians that have never played together and they're going to form rock, you know, or bluegrass musicians that have never played together but they're going to play bluegrass. The fans had no idea what to expect. You know, it's like you see Skrillex on there and you know what Skrillex does. You see Big Gigantic, you know what he does, but what is Robbie Krieger of the Doors? Like, how is he going to fit in? And how is Lauren Hill going to fit in? And how is Janelle Monet going to fit in? Uh, so, for that to be the first time in really probably history that a collaboration with a backing of EDM music uh, to form was just insane. And it, it'll be something that, you know, we obviously never forget. And it was amazing. And the fans, you know, I, I, I hope loved it. I, you know, I think loved it. It was something that they'll, they'll never see again, really. Whose idea was it to have rappers like Lauren Hill, Lauren Hill and Mystic Cal a part of that? Um, a lot of it was, was Sonny's and Sonny's team. Um, you know, once we kind of formed the, the the core band, which was Big Gigantic and Sunny and Thundercat, um, uh, pretty much that was the core band. Then we went through a catalog of special guests that we thought like would make sense, and then um, you know we would just throw out ideas and see what made sense. And we had Damian Marley, so let's do Bob Marley tracks with him. You know, we were gonna have Fuji, so let's Lauren Hill's Are You the Festival? How can we make that into a Fuji track? So like. You know, we really, you know, Sonny went through the list of people. We talked ideas with Paul of, you know, who's a mastermind behind all the super jams. And it was really just a collaboration of who would make sense and really form something special. Will we ever see an album from all those people together? <laughs> I would love to. I have no, I, I would love it. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I hope well, I something hope comes out. Yeah, I, hope I hope it's not just a moment in time because I think that it could really be memorialized. Is, is there is it recorded live? Like, could you guys ever make a live it album? Was, live? It was recorded. I have none of us have seen it yet. It was recorded. Um, we can't wait. I can't wait to see it. You know, it wasn't. It was one of the things that was not streamed, unfortunately. But um, it was it was recorded. So I'm hoping at some point it can get released for again for just everyone to see and see what happened. Was there any reason it wasn't streamed? Um, I don't know the, the reason why. I don't. I don't know the reason why. Cool. I'm sure it'd be tough to clear those tracks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, right. It's fine. It's an ongoing joke of uh, which of these tracks are going to be able to get clear because it, what you will be able to see is we had the amazing uh, Danny Clinch. I don't know if you're familiar with, but he's one of the best well-known rock photographers and videographers in the history of music, and he was with the guys and everything through every step of the way so they're going to definitely make a documentary of uh, of what happened. Oh, that's going to be amazing. Yeah. Very cool. Cool. So, in closing, talk to us a little bit about this song is sick, how you got involved and what sure. the, the future has yeah. in store for the fuck. Um, so I, again, I moved to Boulder in 2008. I got transplanted from LA to start looking the Fox in Boulder Theater. And early on within literally my first few months there, I started seeing traction from a local blog um, run by this guy, Nick, who's now my partner. Um, and he was posting, I would book a show, and at this time it was Mac Miller, it was Wiz Khalifa, and um, it was Dead Mouse, it was Porter Robinson, it was early Skrillex. I mean, this was in 2008, and I was booking all these shows at the Fox, but there was a local blog in town that I would notice that they would post that they, meaning him, Nick would post something about Wiz Khalifa playing the Fox, and ticket sales would just start going up. And then, and I saw that again with Mac Miller. We, I would see a correlation from if this blog posted something, our ticket sales would start to go up. And so clearly there was something there for me to dig into as a promoter of the room um, that this one blog had an influence, had such an influence on on ticket sales. Um, so then I brought brought this song of Sig on as a presenter. At that point, Nick didn't know what that meant. And, you know, I would say, well, put your name on the poster. This song of Sig presents. And I think Mac Miller might have been the first one um, that official presenter on. But uh, put it on, and uh, 
post about it, write about it. We'll give you, you know, we'll put posters around town. And and it was just kind of like a no-brainer, strange thing that he knew. He Nick always knew ahead of time who was going to be the next hot shit, really. And, you know, I knew it on a booking level, but he was dialed in in a different way. And so after a few of these of me putting this song as sick on a, you know, on as our presenter, he and I formed a relationship, uh, friends really at first, and then said, listen, my relationships are with all of these artists, agents, managers, you know, I book all these bands. So, and his relationships were not nothing beyond just having an in and an, having an ear of knowing who to write about. So, you know, I came on board at, to him and just said, let's form a partnership here where, you know, I'm going to have all these shows booked. I have all these connections also with, with all these artists and their managers and their team, and we could use that to do premieres and do actually in, do interviews because, you know, I remember one, you know, I booked Rusko. He wrote about Rusko, but he had no idea how to get in touch with Rusko. So I call Rusko up and say, here's a blog, this, that, and the other. Let's do an interview, and then that gets posted on the site, and then it blew Rusko up in a way. And we did that again with Porter Robinson and, uh, it's endless. It really is. It was amount of. It was just endless amount of connections that he, I had that he was writing about, and so the partnership just made sense. And you know, to this day, Nick is the main writer. I do a lot of the business development and the marketing, and um, we're you know we're starting to build in a very big way with uh, with just new things and you know making it beyond just a blog. And we come and we. We go to festivals now and curate. You know, this weekend we did a this song of sick meet and greets at Spring Awakening with Borgor and A Track and Big Gigantic and Feed Me and you know all these kids that you know and fans that are on the blog all day. It's great for for us and I think for them to really see who's behind all this and see the brand out there, not just in front of their computer. So they come and they get to meet Nick, they get to meet me, they meet Jordan, the whole team, and then meet their favorite artists. And stand in line and, and meet these artists, you know. So um, that's how I got started with the blog. It's now, you know, there's five of us. Um, it's growing. The blog is massive. We have the biggest SoundCloud account uh, play plays that anyone could ever ask for, um, and it's it's just it's amazing, you know, what we've done in, for the electronic space. The virality is really incredible. We had an artist, uh, one of our artists named Pegboard Nerds. We released a premiere with you guys about two weeks ago, and it has yeah. over thirteen thousand shares on your site. Yeah, it's it's nuts. And I mean, it was number two on the Billboard Twitter chart uh, for you know top trending, I guess talked about songs at the moment. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, you could literally record because we've built such a dedicated fan base. I mean, you could literally record this conversation, put it on our SoundCloud page, and it'll have fifty plays, fifty thousand plays within twenty four hours. <laughs> our, I mean, it's just because our, you know, we've, we Nick's very selective as he should be, and you know, he puts up things he really believes about, and luckily those things translate, and um, it's super curated, and and it's worked, you know, and there, there's no other, there's no other way that an artist can get as many plays as we can get you. It's it's a fact. It's not just me saying that. Well, congratulations, Ben. You got your hand in a lot of different pots. <laughs> They all seem like they're full of gold, so. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> all right, I will see you tomorrow, my dude. Yep. All right, guys, and now we're just going to go a little bit across the way in Colorado to Clayton Warwick from the Music Ninja. What's up, Clayton? Hey, what's up, buddy? How are you? I'm doing well, brother. Good to hear. Good to hear. Yes, sir. We got the Pretty Lights poster in the background. Was that oh, one of the yeah. shows? <laughs> Yeah, that was from uh, when he did back-to-back uh, -back shows, one in Denver, one at Red Rocks. So, got to represent the Colorado boys. Yeah, you guys out there, it's like a whole other you know, little country. I come out there so many times a year, and I feel like the music scene especially, it's very unique. What works out there is very different than what might work in other areas of the country. Dude, it's, it's the music industry in, in Colorado is just insane. Um, I mean, we have, obviously, the number one club in the nation, Beta Night Club. We have the number one outdoor venue in the nation, Red Rocks. I mean, if you haven't planned a show to Red Rocks yet, then you haven't really experienced live music the way it should be. Yeah, Red Rocks <laughs> incredible. It was, so, it was just so gratifying to see about six weeks ago now, I think, Cruella, we, they sold out, and it was just 
it was a really gratifying moment to be there for that. Um, yeah, so talk to, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. To talk to us about the Music Ninja, one of my favorite brand names out of all blogs. I think it's phenomenal. <laughs> and furthermore, you guys also have this incredible logo. What's going on with the blog? How did you guys get the voice that you have? And what's in store for the future? You know, I mean, the Music Ninja started back in 2009. It really was founded from uh, a developer. His name's uh, my business partner. His name's Blasi Azeli. Um, he just founded it because he was a developer that loved music. Um, he was also really, really sharp with SEO, um, really knew how to work that angle. So we've kind of acquired um, a lot of our growth through SEO. Um, so I kind of came on just as a writer um, partner when it was really small. And um, through just hard work and dedication and always bugging laws, I'm like, yo, I want to do more, I want to do more, I want to do more. How can I do more with this site? Um, almost to the point of annoying him. Um, he actually put me in charge of artist relations management. Um, so I started that back in, I would say, late 2010, early 2011. And what I did was try to um, uh, apply common business practices to the music industry. Um, what I saw, like, when, when I was going into this, everybody was like, oh, the music industry is cutthroat. You know, you're never, it's, it's so hard, you're, you're just going to get torn up. And I was like, well, I'm going to come in and I'm going to apply what I know about business and business relationships into this industry. So when I went into it, I just treated it like any other business relationship. Um, my background is in advertising and marketing, and um, I, also, I always had to deal with clients when I worked in agencies. So I was like, I'm just going to treat publicists, managers, artists themselves like clients and I'm going to talk to them like people and treat them well and be polite and courteous. And um, that's really how we built this, uh, just this network of really, really close personal contacts like yourself, in fact, um, where we just really feel like it's a working business relationship rather than some kind of cutthroat industry that people are scared to get into. You guys have quite a few writers, too. I've always been impressed with the staff. I feel like you guys are the first on just about everything. I mean, I'm even looking... My artist Zoo is currently number one on Hype Machine, and you guys were, I think, the second blog to write about it, and um, it seems like it just happens really quickly without me even having to reach out and say, hey, you know, we got this new release, check it out and see if it works for your blog. How did you guys develop this culture of being the first on so much hot shit? You know what? I mean, we really just focus on finding people that, that want to write about music that they love. Um, we're not trying to find, you know, I'm not trying to find a kid who wants to write about music and be like, hey, you're assigned this, 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 and this. I really want to find people that uh, really are passionate about music, and I'm like, what are you passionate about? And they tell me what they really want to write about, and we just let them run with it. And we, we really have a knack for finding hunters. I mean, my ninjas, and yeah, I refer to every single one of them as ninjas. They're, we are a clan of ninjas. Um, I mean, they're my people, and they're hunters. They go out, and they find tracks, and I let them run with it. I trust their decisions. Uh, they know that the Music Ninja posts only the highest of quality of music. And so they kind of go into it thinking that, you know, i got to find the hottest tracks and I'm going to write about it and my bosses trust me. And that's really what the culture that we've tried to um, instill in everybody that works with us is that, hey, like, find what you love and write about what you love. We're all music lovers here. We just want to write about good music and share stuff that people will enjoy. And that's really the mindset that we've taken into it, and we've cultured a group of people from around the world. I mean, I have uh, a writer in Melbourne that does our chill dojo every Monday. So you know when you wake up Monday, maybe a little bit hungover from Sunday fun day, you have chill dojo waiting for you. That's just at least 20 tracks of like really chill electronica to just kind of take you through Monday. Uh, we have an indie dojo writer. We have um, a great girl in Southern California who writes our Friday party playlist. It's just it's just a group of people who love music, essentially, is what we've created. That's what's most important. I feel like it's too... I feel like it's really lacking. You know, our panel today at EDM Biz, we talked about it, and I was really honored to be on, you know, curating a panel where it felt like the six people that were on up there with me all really loved music because as I stared into the room and some of the people I was shaking their hands throughout the day, it's like, why? You know, why are you really here? Do you really, really, really love music? And... You know, I don't, I don't know that they do, so it's cool to always see brands of young people coming together, ninjas or otherwise, that are really getting behind great music. So so what advice do you have? I get asked this question a lot. 
people saying they want to start writing for a blog, but let's take it one step further. For people starting a blog, what's your advice to them? Um, I mean, there, there's a couple different levels. I mean, from one, from a writer's perspective, it's find an angle and work with it. I mean, don't don't try and and don't try and please everybody. I mean, we definitely stick to only music. I mean, I definitely frustrate a lot of publicists when I'm like, we don't we don't really po we don't post news, we don't post gossip. We write about music because there's so much great music out there that we feel if we take time to write about, you know, what whoever Dead Mouse is battling in Twitter, that we're going to miss some great music that we could share to, to really enrich somebody's life. And I don't want to miss that opportunity. I want to make someone's life better. I don't want them to click on a link because it was clickbait. Um, I hate to be blunt about that. No offense if you're running a site that is like that. Um, but on, on the other end, from a business end, I, I really encourage people to be around other creative um, business savvy people who are trying to drive and do more with their lives. Um, I'm actually a part of a group in Denver called Stage Incident that is just a creative think tank and it's uh, anywhere from 15 to 20 of us. Everybody is doing the same thing. They're all like, they're working nine to fives but then they're also doing something creative on the side. Hmm. And they're doing, I call it the six to ten. Um, for a lot of people it's like that thing that you do, you go work out, you eat dinner and then you start working again. And Stage Incident is that creative think tank where we all get together and think about how we can work together and improve each other's lives. Um, sorry, my dog just walked in here. <laughs> it threw me off. Um, how did that start? Who put that together? Um, it's actually, it was uh, when I first started to come into the artist relations management um, in Music Ninja, I ran into a good friend of mine named Chris Dominic who. Um, I just ran into him at Beta Nightclub one night, and I was like, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to hustle, and it seems like I'm one of the only people in my age that just wants to hustle and do something different, make something for them, like, that's actually theirs, their own. And he was like, I'm the same way, man. So we just started talking, and um, it just kind of steamrolled, man. We started meeting once a week, and we are like, let's just set aside this time to meet, and we'll see what comes out of it. And whether we just sat around and drank beers and did nothing, or whether we kind of... Um, had some sort of a brainstorm and came up with a really good idea, what, we just always made sure that we had that. And so that just kind of steamrolled into meeting other people who were like-minded. And, I mean, now it's this group where the last group we had, I think it was like, I mean, we had at least probably 12 to 15 people, and they all had something like one guy films action sports photography. Uh, you know, one girl manages a couple of artists in Denver, and it's just a bunch of people that just all want to get together and think about how we can work together to make something creative, um, creative and really cool. I know that sounds well, super. Do you, generic, guys, but... do you guys focus on one at a time, like one biz at a time, or does you know is it just kind of like a mingling session? Um, no, it's uh, at first it started off like a mingling session. As you know, it's hard to just kind of start something up and like get people super focused on an idea. So it started as something pretty general, and then it kind of steamrolled into super specific things. It's, it's how we can all use our talents to create something bigger than our individual talents uh, on itself. And um, it's just you know it's it's pretty infantile right now, but it's turning into to something really cool and I mean we have a lot of really great people a lot of really well respected people in the music industry in Denver in this group um, we have one of our guys who's who's also one of our writers who you know is part of the hundred who's a huge promotion crew in Denver and also uh, works with uh, Night at Night which is um, a budding deep house label in Denver so it's just really fun man we get together and um, you know when you get a bunch of creative people in a room together it just turns out to be a great time you got a good street. For for anybody who is trying to, what's that? You got a good street team company in Denver. Uh, yeah, I'm sure that somebody in there in, in our group of of stage incident has a good street team. I can't. I'm I can't ready, take personal. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay. The million the million dollar blog question. You ready? Yeah. I, I bet you can guess it. I bet you don't even need me to say it. Nah, go ahead, say it. How do you guys make money? Or how are you going to make money? Oof, I mean, it's tough, man. Like, I'll say this to anybody who wants to start a blog. Don't roll into, you know, going into GoDaddy and buying an account, uh, 
uh, URL and thinking that you're going to get mad traffic and it's it's tough. I mean, I'll be honest. There's been times where you know I've dipped into personal money to make sure that the site stays live. Um, it's hard. I mean, you are dependent on ad revenue. I mean, there's definitely different avenues that you can take, different revenue streams that um, you can go about. But, it, I mean, at the end of the day, it is about traffic. It's about providing a product that people are really going to be into. I mean, a Music Ninja, we've always been about music. It's music, music, music. We only want... We want people to come in. We want true music lovers to come in and enjoy themselves, whether it's curating playlists that are around a particular genre or, um, you know, whether it's creating our um, our player that actually, you know, you can you can navigate the whole site with our player. Uh, we have radio streaming services, stuff like that. So we really want people to come in who just want to check out some new tunes and play with it. But, I mean, you have to create a product and you have to have that passion to where people want to come back to your site. Um, and, I mean, I think one thing that's evident for us in our success is, you know, in Hype Machine, we're the third most followed blog on Hype Machine out of 850-some-odd, whatever it is now that's in Hype Machine. Um, and so, really, it's about passion and product creates uh, results, and um, those results are traffic. And you really have to you have to do something different. I know that the temptation's out there to write about news posts or gossip and stuff like that. And it does get you traffic, but um, at the end of the day, man, I'm really about the music, and we're really about the music. And if you come to the Music Ninja, you can guarantee you're going to hear some good tunes, and that's about it. How did your relationship with Hype Machine start? Um, you know, that actually, uh, I mean, it started... I, I honestly, the hype machine is such a mystery to me. Like, does anybody really know how it works? I mean, <laughs> hey, well, I would assume you guys being the third most, most followed blog, I thought I asked the right person. To <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, oh, you just muted out. Um, there you good? go. Yep, we're good now. I, I will say that, I mean, I think our success in hype machine has been, I mean, obviously, um, you know, we're posting, we get a lot of great premieres, um, which is always great. I mean, High Machine did, did switch their format to where it doesn't always show who premiered it first. Um, but, you know, in the past, uh, that always helped us out. We were always getting good premieres. And, I mean, we, I mean, I don't, we post really high-quality music. But we're super picky about what we post. Um, it's just always been a big thing for us to make sure that we're posting the highest-quality music. We want people to come to us and expect only the best of the best. Even I want, like, for me, I'm more of a folk and indie guy. Like, I mean, I love, I love, I love myself some beats, but at the same time, like, I love a dude with an acoustic guitar, and I want some kid who loves beats to just be scrolling and be like, oh, damn, I love this folk song. This is sick. And, like, at the end of the day, that's, if, if we can do that, then we want. And I think that shows in our Hype Machine ranking is that people know that it's all quality coming through here. All quality. Have you heard this artist, Jack Garrett, and his song, Worry? Definitely. Yeah, I love that record. I think it's kind of <laughs> that vibe you're talking about. I figured you'd like that. Yeah. And cool. if, I can, if I can plug one, one track, uh, we just Please. premiered. <laughs> we just, and this is, this is for me personally, we just premiered James Bay's video. Um, he is a 23-year-old songwriter from the UK. Absolutely stunning. The kid is going to blow up. You heard it here. He will be um, all over the radio in a matter of months. And uh, if you get a chance, go to our site, musicninja.com. Um, it's probably like the fifth yeah, or sixth yeah. post now. Now, Clayton, thank you so much for joining us on 20-something Live. We will remember that you said it here first. Everybody, <laughs> please go to the musicninja.com right now and check out Mr. Bay's video. Six <laughs> Thanks, Jay. Appreciate it, buddy. Let's go on in Colorado. Hit you up, buddy. Cheers. All right, guys. I'm sorry that we were late today getting everything organized from Las Vegas. It's going to be a big EDC weekend. They obviously have a lot planned and an incredible live stream. It'll be interesting to talk about that next week, and I will see you then. Thank you. And thanks to everybody for joining me.